Okay, Mike, thank you for that, uh, for that nice introduction. I appreciate it very much. We have a lot of legislators here, and I am so blessed. We are one team. I'm telling you, I, I love working with the legislature. We are focused. We are focused on continuing to see Iowa move in the right direction, and they are working hard on your behalf every single day. And it's just an honor for me to be able to, to work with them and work alongside them, to be uh, quite honest. Holy cow, what a great crowd. I got through most of it, so if I didn't get you hugged on the first go-around, we'll try to do it one more time and stand up, hold your hand up, and say, I missed my hug uh, the first time. But this is an incredible turnout. And, you know, what I love most about Iowans is you show up, and uh, it's because you care. You care about our country. You care about our state. You care about our freedoms. And it truly does matter. And I think because you do show up, it is one of the reasons that we actually saw a red wave this last election. It didn't happen in many other states, but it happened right here in Iowa. And, you know, maybe because we did a few good things, passed a few good policies, and we are, you know, our national profile is rising, but when you show up, you elect the team that really focuses on you and making this country better. So thank you for doing that, and thanks for showing up. It really makes a difference. And now as we move to the next election and we get ready for our First in the Nation caucus, we also, again, have a great responsibility. I always take it very seriously, just like today, you show up. But, you know, so I felt that it was my responsibility as the governor of the state of Iowa to welcome all of our candidates to Iowa, to provide them kind of a platform where they could share their message and their vision for Iowans to help put their best foot forward. And I did that. And so for seven months, our candidates have crisscrossed our state, and they've made the pitch about why they think they are the person uh, to lead, to become the next president. And Iowans have showed up. I'm telling you, I did a lot of events with them, crowds at all of them. Iowans have showed up. They've listened. We've started to see the field narrow, and that's what we do in, in Iowa. That's the process. Um, and so it's, it's all working. But I also believe that as a mom and as a grandmother and as an American, I felt like I could not sit on the sidelines any longer. We are in unprecedented times, and there is too much at stake. Our country is in trouble, and our world is a time bomb. And we need to make sure that we get this right this next election. We have to make sure that we, yeah, it is so important. We are not going to get a do-over. We're not going to get a do-over. This country is resilient. Americans are resilient. We can get this country back on track after four years of the crazy, insane things that we see happening in this country. But if we don't win this next election, I am really fearful of where we go and how we have lost this country. So it is so important. So when we show up on January 15th and we go to the caucus, we need to make sure that we choose wisely, that we make the right decision, that we elect somebody who can actually win and beat Joe Biden. And we need a president who has the skills and the resolve to reverse the madness that we see on a daily basis. We need a president that is focused on the future and not the past. And we need a president who puts Americans and America first. And I'm here to tell you that that man is Ron DeSantis. He is the right leader for the right time. I'm not done. I'm going to say a few more nice things about you. They're trying to wrangle, wrangle up some kids. So one of the things I respect so much and admire about him is this is a guy that gets things done. It is incredible. And all you have to do is look at his record, whether it's COVID and the way that he responded to that. He kept his economy open and he kept his kids in school, just like some other state I know, Iowa. He has backed parents. He has backed educational freedom. He has backed law enforcement. He took on Disney. And when a hurricane struck his state, this guy didn't just cut through red tape, he blew it up and built a bridge in three days. That does not happen. Just so you know, that does not happen. With all my heart, 
Lord, I believe that he is the most effective leader that I have ever seen. He is a guy who will do the right thing, that has the conviction to make the right choices when it's not easy to do. He is a fighter, he is a leader, and he is a winner, and he is the candidate that will get this country back on track. Please welcome the next president of the United States, Ron DeSantis. Thanks so much to Governor Reynolds, and we've got uh, we got the family with us on this one. My, my wife has made uh, one campaign promise to people that uh, with us in the White House, the only thing our kids are going to be bringing back to the White House is homework, not cocaine. And I think you can see that. Give me a high five. All right, you guys want to say anything? She had great line prepared, but you know, sometimes it's an acquired skill to get up here and be able to speak in front of people. So it's great to be um, uh, in Southeast Iowa. I want to thank Governor Reynolds for her support, uh, but more importantly for the great job she's done for Iowa and really for this country uh, by being a strong leader, by standing for our values, and by delivering big results. And you see that with how Iowa is governed. I mean, you just got, don't have to go very far from here to see a much different model of governance. Some of you probably are Illinois residents who came here. Um, probably not what you want. And I, I know this personally because in Florida, I get a front seat to what's going on in this country because people visit Florida and they move to Florida from all across the country. So I can go down, I mean, you go down to uh, Southwest Florida in January, it's like half of Wisconsin and Illinois, and they're all down there. So I talk to people, and the people that come from Illinois, they, are, they have never anything good to say about how Illinois is governed, let me tell you that. People that come from now Minnesota have been fleeing, they're, they're uh, not, not happy with what's going on. Uh, but the, the Iowans I meet, like Marco Island, Benita Springs, all these places, uh, they will say, oh, we love what you're doing in Florida, and we love what our governor's doing in Iowa. And so you see that, and you see how people appreciate uh, the leadership. And she had to show it during COVID, because I remember she, uh, 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 we were probably the only two, or certainly there weren't very many governors who very early on said, wait a minute, you're just going to lock the kids out of school? That doesn't work. It's not science-based. It's not the right thing. So we took a stand. And I know that I, I got a lot of incoming. I got hammered pretty good, and so did she. The question is, you know, are you just going to stand and do what's right and, and, and make the right judgments? And she was able to do that, and the kids in the state are much better off as a result, just like the kids in Florida are much better off. But, and, and, you know, leadership is also about, so, so uh, Governor Reynolds mentioned a couple of things that we did. You know, we had a hurricane in southwest Florida. People were stranded on the barrier islands, and they were told it would be about six months before they could go back and forth. So they came to me, asked if I could do anything. And so the first bridge we rebuilt, not in six months, but in three days. Uh, the Sanibel Causeway we did in two weeks uh, after that, which had been broken in three spots. So you just got to figure out a way to get things done. Just recently, so when Hamas attacked Israel on October 7th, well, one, I knew that that was a monumental event for the Middle East because that was uh, an equivalent of like a dozen 9-11s, given how small Israel's population was. But I also knew just being governor of Florida that there was going to be uh, a lot of impact on my state because we have people that go back and forth. I've got a big Israeli-American population, the whole nine yards. And so come to find out, day or two goes by, and Biden had basically stranded the Americans in Israel. The State Department wasn't helping, the embassy wasn't helping, and people had nowhere to go. So I said, all right, we'll step up. So I did an executive order. Uh, we scrambled our assets. We sent planes to Israel, and we were able to rescue over 700 Americans and bring them back home. <laughs> And uh, then what the administration was doing, they said, okay, well, we'll, we'll take you out of Israel, 
but we'll dump you in Greece and you just gotta figure out how to get home, and then we'll send you a bill for our services. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, if you come to this country illegally, this government will fly you anywhere in the country free of charge. They will uh, put you in hotels, nice hotels, and uh, for, for weeks on end with no charge. And yet, you're going to charge American citizens that are fleeing the war zone? That just shows you these people in D.C., they put the American people last. It's all about their agenda. And it's all about what they want to do. And you have technocratic elites in the bureaucracy. You have entrenched politicians. But they are driving this country into the ground. They are facilitating the decline of our country. And you see it with the economy. All the things that you have to pay for now that are much more expensive, groceries, gas, forget about taking out a mortgage with the interest rates, all of that was facilitated by Washington, D.C. bureaucrats and politicians. They borrowed so much money, they printed so much money, they spent so much money, and now you are paying the bill. They're living high on the hog, uh, but then that's something you have to figure out how to make ends meet. They never have to make those decisions. They have exposed the American people to serious risk by having an open border at the, at the U.S.-Mexico border. When the, the Israel attack happened, I also thought, you know, if Hamas can go massacre all these people in Israel when they have some of the strongest border security in the world, what is happening at our own border? Do you not think that our enemies haven't been taking advantage of this over the last, of course they have. We know that by the government's own estimates, there have been people, hundreds of people, on the terror watch list that have come through. We know people have come from Iran, from the Middle East, from China, from Russia, from all these different places. Uh, and so you're just supposed to deal with that risk. You're supposed to have the fentanyl flowing into your communities. People are dying as a result of this. The people up in D.C., they don't care about any of that. They're happy to just let it continue to go. You look at the degradation of our military. Our military recruiting is at a 50-year low or a post-Vietnam era low in terms of people that are willing to sign up. You see a lot of woke ideology in the military now, social experimentation, not following mission first, and really running out of uh, stockpiles and ammo and weapons. And we're weaker as a country as a result. There's more danger that has gravitated around the world because of American weakness. And you want to stay out of conflict, you want to stay out of war, the only way that's been proven to do that is through strength. That's how you achieve the peace, and they're not doing that. They have also uh, hijacked our education system, and instead of traditional schooling, they are using it to indoctrinate kids in all kinds of, of bad ideologies, and the result, of course, has been our students are performing poor and poor as a result. Not in Florida, where we've taken it, but in many other places, that's what they've done. They've also allowed criminals in many of these major cities to have open season, put them back on the street. They don't prosecute them. These prosecutors get uh, elected by Soros-funded money, and then they go and they pick and choose which laws they're going to enforce, and American families are paying the price for that with less safe communities. And then they exert so much power through this fourth branch of government, this unaccountable, unelected bureaucracy, the Founding Fathers never cre uh, created four branches of government. Uh, this is something that's accumulated power over many decades. Uh, they impose their will on us without our consent, and they have weaponized these agencies against us through a variety of different mechanisms and with a variety of different agencies. And so our constitutional system is completely out of whack and is un would be unrecognizable uh, to the Founding Fathers. But here's the deal. There's a lot of people that say, the, the, the elites in D.C. that have put us there, they want to tell you that you should be happy uh, for what they've given you, that, that you can't expect to have great outcomes anymore in this country, that uh, we're more in an era of limits and your understanding of what's possible needs to be altered because ultimately what they care about is pursuing their agenda. Uh, I am not going to let them drive this country into the ground any longer. It's time that we stand up and it's time that we fight back. We don't have to re be resigned to have our country continue to decline. It's not inevitable. It's a choice. It's a choice that we as Americans get to make uh, over these next weeks, months, and, and over the next year. Uh, we can't be satisfied with simply managing the decline of our country a little bit better than the Democrats. 
We have to reverse the country's decline. We have to choose revival. We have to bring this country a new birth of freedom, and we need to win in order to do that. Iowa shows that it can be done. Florida shows it can be done. If you look, Republicans haven't done very well recently in recent elections. Uh, we don't have as many success stories as we should have, uh, but these are two states to show that it, that it actually can be done. And how do you do it? Well, I think you've got to do a, a couple, a few things. One, you've got to fight for people. Two, you've got to win for people. Uh, and three, you've got to be willing to lead, especially when things aren't easy. So, we have a lot of people in the Republican Party over the years. They go to D.C., they become part of the swamp, and they never fight for us. When the going gets tough, they cave to the media, to the left, to the Democrats, you name it. They don't fulfill their promises, uh, and the result is the country continues to go downhill. Uh, I have fought for people in the state of Florida. When we had COVID and all the hysteria that was going on, Fauciism, the media, the left, a lot of even Republicans, they were saying you had to do this and just continue to follow anything Fauci says. And I said, you know, um, that's not going to work here. Uh, that's not the right thing. Uh, I know that I'm going to face a lot of flack for saying that, but you as a leader have got to be willing to care more about protecting the jobs of the people you represent than you do about protecting your own political hide. And so I was willing to put my neck out on the line uh, to do what was right, to choose freedom over Fauciism. <laughs> and people needed a voice at that time. Uh, people who needed to put food on the table. They did not have a voice in media. They didn't have a voice in any of the narrative. Uh, they needed you to stand up and fight for them. Uh, and so that's exactly what we did. That's what Governor Reynolds did when it came uh, to a lot of these issues as well. We also had to fight about the innocence and the well-being of our children. We had a fight, and it's crazy that we're even having to talk about this, about what's appropriate to be teaching kids, particularly in these early grades. And as the father of a 6, 5, and a 3-year-old, I believe that kids should be able to go to school, watch cartoons, just be kids without having an agenda shoved down their throat. <laughs> It's wrong to teach a first grader that they were born in the wrong body. Uh, it's wrong to teach a second grader that their gender is somehow a choice. And yet, that is being done in parts of this country, and we fought in Florida uh, to keep that out of our schools. Now, the left didn't like it, the media didn't like it, but that just goes, uh, that's par for the course. I mean, I roll out of bed in the morning and they get after me, so that's fine. <laughs> But we also had to, to, to face opposition from the state's most powerful company, Disney, who came in full throttle uh, to try to stop our parents' rights legislation. And a lot of people told me, similar with COVID, like, hey, this is not a fight you want to be involved in. They'll steamroll you, all this stuff. And, and this, and again, it's like, okay, why are you in this? Are you in this just to bide your time? Are you in this to take the path of least resistance? Or if you have a time, if you have an opportunity to fight for people where it matters, are you going to stand up and take that opportunity? And so I don't care what anybody says. I don't care what people, how powerful they are. Uh, we stand for the well-being of our children. We will fight anybody that seeks to rob them of their innocence. And so we told Disney to pound sand. Uh, we signed the legislation, and we won the battle for our kids. And you got to be willing to fight, but you also have to do it in a way that's going to produce victories. you got to win. Uh, you got to win elections, and you saw here Governor Reynolds with a bold agenda won a huge victory. In Florida, we won the biggest victory for any Republican governor candidate in the history of the state of Florida in 2022. And our state had always been a state where the elections were very, very close. But we led uh, and we got uh, huge results. So, so you've got to be willing to do that. And, and, and clearly we've had problems with that as Republicans in recent years. Uh, but you also have to be able to win on all these policy battles. Deliver results for people. So in Florida, everything I said I would do, we've delivered on. We enacted a Parents' Bill of Rights. We protected women's sports in Florida. We uh, banned the transgender surgeries for the minor kids in Florida. <laughs> we 
we enacted universal school choice. Uh, we eliminated the ideology, the CRT, and the gender ideology in schools. We made sure to have uh, expand Second Amendment rights with constitutional carry. Uh, we did the Heartbeat Protection Act. We did the um, anti-ESG legislation. You know, ESG, their environment, social governance, it's basically using business to impose an ideological agenda. We kneecapped that in Florida. We had BlackRock had been managing $2 billion in our pension plan. I, uh, plan. I took it away from them. Uh, and we said we're not going to let some of these massive corporations uh, go around the constitutional process and impose their agenda on us without our consent. Uh, we also enacted a ban on sanctuary cities. Uh, we enacted mandatory E-Verify, and we even transported 50 illegal aliens to beautiful Martha's Vineyard, which really was important, and it changed the dynamic. We've cut taxes by record amounts. We've run big budget surpluses, and since I've been governor, we've paid down almost 25% of our state's total outstanding debt that it accumulated throughout its history. Imagine seeing that in that. We have prohibited the purchase of land by the Chinese Communist Party in the state of Florida. No land near military, no farmland, nothing. We've also uh, eliminated so-called DEI in our public universities. Now, it's, they say it's diversity, equity, and inclusion, but the reality is the way it's practiced, it's an ideological agenda. It better stands for discrimination, exclusion, and indoctrination, and that has no place in our public universities. And we're the first state to do that. And we also did... Uh, ban on all the vax mandates during COVID and mask mandates and made sure that we have medical freedom, not just when I'm governor, but for 10, 20, 30 years into the future. We don't want ever to have Floridians uh, be at risk of what happened in so many of these other countries or so many of these other states around the country. We have a 50-year low in the crime rate, partially because we back the blue. Uh, we prohibit our local governments from defunding police. We uh, have enacted uh, policies like the death penalty for pedophiles. We've made sure to remove, I had two prosecutors, the rogue prosecutors supported by Soros. I removed both of them from their posts, Tampa and Orlando. And so, and we've done much more, but uh, the results are now Florida has the number one ranked economy by CNBC. We're number one for economic freedom. Number one in education by U.S. News, number one for education freedom, number one for parental involvement in education, number one in new business formations, uh, number one for fastest growing, number one for net in migration, thank you, Illinois and other states, <laughs> and on and on it goes. And so that is winning. You win at the ballot box, but then you win for the people. And people used to say Florida was such a competitive state. Now they just assume it's like this strong Republican state. But just five years ago, people were saying it was going to go blue. And now they're saying just the opposite. So, so the results and winning really, really matters. Uh, but you also have to lead. And the thing about leadership is it's about standing for what's right, pursuing the vision when it's not easy. It's easy to do it when the wind's at your back. Anybody can do that. Uh, that's like shooting fish in the barrel. But the question is, uh, when you stand for what's right right now, given the way our country is, the media, the, the, the left, all this stuff, it is not going to be cost-free. Uh, they are going to come at you. Uh, you're going to face a lot of incoming. And so the question is, is that something uh, that you're going to be able uh, to handle? And I can tell you this. I do not care what they say about me. Uh, I will take the slings. I will take the arrows. I will take the smears. I will take the attacks. Because ultimately, it's not about me. It's about you. And I need to be able to stand up for you. I need to be able to fight for you. I need to be able to win for you. And I need to be able to lead this country to the comeback that it deserves. And I'm willing to stand my ground to do that.
And we have no other choice. We are in jeopardy of being the first generation of Americans to leave to our kids and grandkids in America less prosperous and less free than the one we inherited. And as the father of a 6'5 and a 3-year-old, that does not sit well with me. Uh, I think that would be breaking faith with every generation of Americans that have come before us. Uh, so we've got a lot of work to do. But people understand uh, throughout our history that there are times when you've got to step up and get it right. So we've got to be able to go in on January 20th, 2025, and lead this country uh, back to where it belongs. And that will start with making sure the American dream is restored. If you're working hard and you're doing everything right, you ought to be able to get ahead in this country. You shouldn't be falling further further behind. You shouldn't have to deal with crushing inflation, crushing interest rates. We need to make sure we use all of our energy resources so you pay lower for gas and energy, and our country is energy independent and energy dominant, and we will get that done. We need to have American sovereignty restored. You should not have Mexican drug cartels running our border. We should not have millions of people pouring in. I'm sending the military to the border. I'm stopping the invasion. I'm going to deport the people that have come illegally. We will build a border wall and we'll have Mexico pay for it by charging fees on the remittances that people send back to foreign countries from this country. And maybe most important, we're going to hold the Mexican drug cartels accountable for what they are doing. We have thousands, tens of thousands of deaths because of fentanyl every year that they're bringing into this country. And it's not just people you know, in San Francisco that are, that are drug addicts that are doing it every day. You have people who may take one pill, like a college student, thinking it's something else. It's laced with fentanyl, and they can overdose and die just on that one pill. We had a case in Florida where an 18-month-old baby was crawling on the carpet of an Airbnb rental. There happened to be residue from fentanyl on the carpet, and the baby died just from that contact. So can you imagine that this is something that's acceptable, yet the people in D.C., they just shrug their shoulders. They don't care. I care about it. I'm going to do something about it. We're going to treat the Mexican drug cartels like foreign terrorist organizations, and we will authorize the use of deadly military force to stop what they're doing. We will also ensure that this century remains an American century, not a Chinese century. We need to revitalize our military. We need to take the woke and all the nonsense out of it, uh, refocus on mission first, make sure we bolster our defenses so that we can fend off the threat posed by the CCP. And if we're able to do that, uh, we will still have a free society if we allow China uh, to be the dominant power in this, wor in this world, this will impact every American family, and it will impact our freedom. And the way you end up with that is if you choose surrender over strength, uh, we will choose peace through strength, and we will be better off for doing that. We also need to improve our education system. Stop with the indoctrination. Focus on the basics. We don't want the CRT. We don't want the gender ideology. We want to teach kids American civics, teach them about our Constitution and what it means to be an American. We don't want these universities to be indoctrination centers. And we shouldn't be funding universities that are doing things like praising Hamas terrorists in the aftermath of this these attacks. And I've said, I mean, you know, I have experienced this because, you know, I was a blue-collar kid growing up in Florida. I'm playing baseball and everything, and then I ended up getting recruited uh, to play baseball at Yale, working minimum wage jobs to get through, and then I did got a degree from Harvard Law School. So I can say that I'm one of the few people in this country to get through both Harvard and Yale and come out more conservative than when I went in. That's not easy to do. So I understand what goes on at these universities, but, but when I was there, as, as bad as it was, you would not have had students when the blood wasn't even dry off the Jews that were killed in the most deadly attack against Jews since the Holocaust. You would not have seen, in my day, students actually out there celebrating that. You know, that's what we've seen. And some of these people uh, really don't even have a right to be in our country. If you're a foreign student and you're on a foreign visa and you are making common cause with Hamas, 
as president, I'm canceling your visa and I'm sending you home where you belong. We also will ensure that whether you live in a red state or a blue city, that criminals are held accountable for their crimes. You can't let the inmates run the asylum. You can't just put people back on the street. All that does is pass the buck and then somebody else gets victimized. We will ensure that every American family from coast to coast can raise their kids in peace and in security. We will restore the rule of law throughout this land. We will also restore the Constitution to its proper role in American life. We should have a limited government that works alongside us, not an unaccountable bureaucracy that imposes its will on us, that is weaponized against us, and that governs us without our consent. We will reconstitutionalize the federal government. We will bring the administrative state to heel, and we will end the weaponization of federal power once and for all. And there's a lot more that we'll do, but if we're able to, to knock all that out, uh, which we will, uh, we will be able to say that we've restored America to what President Reagan called the shining city on a hill. Uh, we will have left her stronger, we will have left her more prosperous, uh, and we will have left her uh, to the next generation better than we found her. And we have no choice but to step up and answer this challenge. President Reagan himself said freedom's one generation away from extinction. It's not something that's passed along in the bloodstream. It's something that each generation has to fight for and cultivate. Uh, and he was right about that. Uh, our founding fathers understood that. When they went to Philadelphia to frame the Constitution in 1787, they had studied the history of every republic and the history of mankind because they wanted to draw lessons for what had happened uh, throughout history. And the only thing that they identified that was a common theme throughout every republic in human history was this. Every single one of them had failed. And so they understood it fell to the United States of America to determine once and for all, uh, can people really govern themselves? Can you have a country based on the idea that our rights come from God, not from the government? Uh, that we're supposed to live under a rule of law rather than the whim of individual men? Or... Is mankind forever destined to live under various forms of despotism? And they believed that this country would be the one to answer that question. But they knew that they weren't finally answering the question just for what they did in Philadelphia in 1787. When Benjamin Franklin walked out of the convention, he was asked, did you give us a monarchy or a republic? He said, a republic, ma'am, if you can keep it. You can have the best constitution in the world. You can have the best declaration of independence in the world. These things do not run on autopilot. They require every generation of Americans to answer the call when freedoms threaten. And sometimes that means put on a uniform, risk your life, and even give the last full measure of devotion for service to this country. Now, we're not called upon to give sacrifices of that nature. Uh, but what we are called upon to do uh, is to do justice to those sacrifices to make sure that we are not allowing freedom uh, to slip through our fingers because we didn't do all we can when it was under attack. Uh, our responsibility and our mission is to preserve what George Washington called the sacred fire of liberty. It's a fire that burned in Independence Hall in 1776 when 56 men pledged their lives, their fortune, and their sacred honor to, to create a nation conceived in liberty. It's a fire that burned at a cemetery in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, when our nation's first Republican president pledged this nation to a new birth of freedom. It's the fire that burned in the beaches of Normandy when a merry band of brothers took on the Nazis, ended tyranny in Europe, and saved the world. And it's a fire that burned at the foot of the Berlin Wall in 1987 when a resolute president stood, faced down communism, and said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. This is the sacred fire of liberty that we must preserve. This is the torch that we must carry on. It's a responsibility that we should not shy from. It's a responsibility we should welcome. Uh, I welcome the challenge. Uh, I welcome the opportunity to ensure that America remains the last best hope on earth. I'm asking for your support uh, in the Iowa caucus in January. Uh, talk to your friends, your neighbors, 
Tell them uh, how great it is to have Governor Reynolds on board. Hopefully people will, will follow suit with that uh, because we're not going to get a mulligan on the 2024 election. Uh, we've got to make sure that, that we win the election, but then we actually <coughs> deliver on all these things. And my focus is not going to be on me. My focus is going to be on you. Uh, I will go in and methodically get the job done. Uh, we will deliver the big victories that we need to be able to get this country back on track. No time for distractions, no time for anything other than the American people's business. As your nominee, I will make sure that we win across the board. Uh, as a leader, I'll always be somebody that you can be proud of. And as your president, I can promise you, I will not let you down. Thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. Anyone have any questions? Yes. So reforming legal immigration, you're saying? Oh, absolutely. I mean, think about it. Um, so we talk a lot about illegal immigration. It's a huge problem. We'll stop it cold. Uh, I think all the people that came in under Biden, you know, they, they register them, so we kind of know where they are. So we're going to go. You're going to see um, uh, people get sent back. And I think you have to have that. If that's not the penalty, then you're never going to get it under control. Um, but there, no one really talks about the legal immigration system. And there's some Republicans that say, as long as it's legal, it doesn't matter. I, I don't subscribe to that. I think that uh, immigration should only be done when it benefits the American people. If it doesn't benefit the American people, then it should not be something that's being done. So, for example, I look at what's happening in Europe. Uh, you have more uh, anti-Semitism in Germany than at any time since Adolf Hitler. Is that just because the native Germans all of a sudden took a turn? No, it's because of their immigration policies. They've imported a lot of people who are bringing that culture and those views with them. I was the first presidential candidate to say when people uh, like the squad in Congress were calling on the U.S. to import hundreds of thousands of refugees from the Gaza Strip, I said no. I said we are not going to be bringing in Gaza Strip refugees, particularly by the hundreds of thousands, and people said, well, they're, they're not all members of Hamas. Well, first of all, they elected Hamas. Second of all, they were cheering in the streets when these Jews were massacred uh, on October 7th. So don't act like they don't support Hamas. But even if there's some that don't, the reality is they teach the kids to hate Jews. The textbooks do not have Israel listed on the map. Their goal is the complete destruction of the Jewish state. Uh, and so you're going to bring that into our... How does that benefit you? Does that benefit your family to be importing like that? No. So in order to come to this country, you have to believe in the principles and ideals that the country was founded on. Uh, and you've got to be willing to assimilate into this country. If you're not willing to do that, we don't have to do it. And you know, a lot of these other countries... Very few countries are, are as dumb as we are in some of this stuff. Um, you know, it's like Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Jordan, all them. They're not accepting any Gaza, uh, Palestinian Arabs from the Gaza. They're just like, no, we're not doing it. Because they're concerned about how that can impact their country. So they don't, even, they don't even contemplate it. So when you're dealing with this, though, you need a president that's not going to be politically correct. We just have to be honest about what, what's going on. We have to be honest that it's not true that every single person throughout the world aspires to an American-style uh, government. Uh, that I, trust me, I served in Iraq back in the day when I was on active duty. Uh, it was, we're going to create a democracy in Iraq, people said. And you get there, and you talk, and you talk to these people. They did not want an American-style uh, country. Uh, their view of freedom was not our view of freedom. Their view of freedom was submission to Islamic law, Sharia law. Yeah. That's what they believed. That, that's, that was their worldview. And, and now look what you have in Iraq. Yeah, they did vote, and basically the Shia mob outvoted the Sunni mob. So you have uh, the government that's uh, part and parcel of Iran now. Uh, that has not served our national interest, but it was premised in part on a really bogus assumption that somehow everyone throughout the world, if you bring them in by large numbers, that somehow this is what people aspire to. Some do, but many don't. And you just have to understand that. So we will 
be very, very strong on that. I do not want to create a situation in Europe like they've done with their stupid policies, uh, bringing in so many people that, that did not want to assimilate into this country. Uh, look, people have come from all places who've loved this country and have assimilated and have done well, um, and, and we should be thankful for that. But what's going on in Europe, I think, is going to cause them problems for the next 50 years. Yeah, so I think, I think the, 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 the question is basically about how the left will manipulate language to serve their political ends. So, for example, the CDC will put out guidance about pregnant people. You know, I'm just not going to accept uh, the idea that a man can get pregnant, okay? I'm not going to accept it. We can't accept it as a society. But when you see that, and then you think about it, well, wait a minute, they're, they're somehow giving us medical advice, and they can't even acknowledge that, that a man can't get pregnant. Uh, very concerning. What they're doing in these medical schools now, uh, some of them are doing like a woke Hippocratic Oath. It's, it's kind of the ideology trumps evidence-based medicine now in, in many respects. And I think about it, it's like, okay, you graduate from like Harvard Medical School, you know, that used to be, that would be someone you would want to, 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 to have look at you for, 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 for uh, service or whatever. But I'm like, wait a minute, you're graduating from those schools, um, and do you think there are 37 genders or do you think that there are two? I mean, like, you know, can you answer that question? And a lot of them probably can't because of what they're being put in. So uh, I think it's just a question about society needs to be rooted in truth. Uh, the truth will set you free. And don't try to uh, conform to any of this stuff. Just, just be honest, speak the truth. And I think people, they know when they're being bamboozled. They know when some of this stuff, like the whole pregnant people thing, it doesn't go over well with most citizens. And so we're going to speak the truth, and we'll make sure that all federal agencies uh, are in line with the truth. We're not going to allow you know, the stuff that clearly is, is ideology rather than fact-based. Yes, sir. Good. When and if you're elected, you will take an oath to the Constitution, and part of it in preamble says you will promote our general welfare. If this applies to the economy, our political system, our medical system. So right now, our economy has put 40 to 60 percent of everybody working in America today at the end of the week without a Well, 
That's a great question. So, so one, I think, you know, how did we get here with the economy? Uh, and I think it got a lot worse starting with the COVID-19 lockdowns. So we have to have a reckoning on that and make sure that people understand and all the government agencies responsible for promoting that, that that was wrong, that those were destructive policies, that Fauciism did not work with respect to, to COVID, but it did huge damage all across this country. When you stop the economy, yes, Iowa, Florida, you know, Georgia, you know, we, we bucked it early and, and kind of did our thing, but you pay people not to work, you print $2.2 trillion, the Fed increases the money supply, and then they do another $2 trillion in December of 2020, and then Biden comes in and he does $2 trillion in March. I mean, if you could just print your way to prosperity, why not print 30, 40? We know that people, ultimately, the bill comes due. So those are the policies that have driven the inflation that we've seen. It disrupted supply chains. It's disrupted the labor market. It's disrupted all these different things. Uh, of course, you're going to end up having uh, inflation when those policies are put in place. And people were predicting it at the time, uh, even in Congress, uh, like Congressman Thomas Massey. So that's ultimately where we're there. So how do you how do you address that? Well, one, Congress can't keep spending money at the rate it's spending. I mean, they basically yeah. locked in yeah. this higher level of spending. <laughs> And it's not good. Two, uh, we need to use all of our energy resources that we have here and develop and produce as much of our traditional energy as possible. That is deflationary. The energy permeates everything that goes on through the economy. Obviously, you pay um, at the pump. And I saw coming in here, you guys are under $3. I can tell you in many parts of the country, uh, that is not the case. And in some places, like California, you know, I've seen 6 and $7 within the last two months um, out there. So doing that will bring the cost of gas down, but it also permeate the rest of the economy. That puts it down. Because any business that is producing things, you, know, you look at how much cost, they've got to make a profit. So if energy prices have doubled, well, then that's going to go into everything that they do. And we see that all throughout the economy. So, so that, I think, is something that it's right at our fingertips. It's a question, though, Biden wants a Green New Deal. Um, that's ideology. That's not evidence-based. Uh, it will absolutely make life more difficult for working people. You will pay more. There's no question about that. Our country will be less secure. So getting that energy piece right, I think, is very important. And then look at the role that the bureaucracy and the red tape um, have played in increasing costs on society and on the economy. Uh, I think it's been really, really dramatic, and it typically hurts small businesses because the big guys get a competitive advantage whenever government uh, starts to get out. So you have bureaucracy doing rules and regulations and all these things that are not actually passed uh, by the people's representatives. So I'm going to take Bidenomics, the uh, executive orders, the bureaucracy, all that, day one, rip it out, throw it in the trash can. We're going to be giving people the ability to succeed again, particularly uh, when you're low, uh, uh, small businesses. Now, in terms of health care, what COVID showed was we have a system that is really dominated. I mean, I think a lot of people knew this, but when they saw it in action, it was even worse dominated by big insurance companies, big pharma, and big government. And the patient and the doctor are really um, at the back of the bus. It's not even really, if you look at the number of people that graduate medical school and even go into private practice now, it's dramatically less than it was 50 years ago. Their doctors end up being employees of hospitals. And look, if that's what you want to do, that's fine. But my sense is, is that the practice of medicine has become more about paperwork and bureaucracy than actually yes, seeing patients. Yes, so yes. that is going to mean that the most talented people uh, who were told 50 years ago to be doctors, they're going to end up going to private equity or they're going to end up doing anything. And look, if that's what they want to do, that's fine. But I think we've made it to where it's not even something that people want, want to be involved in to the extent that we need it. There are shortages there. That will absolutely increase uh, the cost. I, pharmaceuticals are one of the reasons that are driving up the cost. I mean, you can get the same drug in Canada uh, for 25 cents on the dollar uh, that you have in the United States. And that's because of pharma's power, how they've done the, the laws here. What I would say is that all the developed countries who get access to these drugs, we should all pay the same. So, you know, they're paying less and we're subsidizing them. 
I think we should all pay the same. You have to work out a deal to be able to do that, but that will save people. What we did in Florida to lower drug costs, and it's not the, the, the end-all, be-all, but we kneecap these pharmacy benefit managers. They're middlemen, basically, and they impose costs on the consumer and are actually very bad for family pharmacies because the more local, the more you have family practice, family pharmacy, all that, it is going to be more affordable. When it comes to be big conglomerates doing everything, the prices will go up. So we knocked out the pharmacy uh, middlemen. I know they're trying to do it in Iowa. Yeah, Kim probably will get that done. And look, some people are making a lot of money based off that, but it's definitely not the way you run the system, and it's definitely not the way you want to, to um, uh, help consumers.